also does the toilet water really flush the other way in australia is that a thing <laughs> you know now that you say that i've never even really looked i couldn't even tell you which way it flushes in north america so i wouldn't know if it was going one way or the other i tend to not look from the bottom ain't no half stepping i'm the dog i made it through so they don't ask questions long beach and it ain't no half repping once a dog always a dog so they don't ask questions Timothy Peterson has 30 years of global investment experience and is a chartered financial analyst and chartered alternative investment analyst. He is a published expert on cryptocurrency investment valuation and is the investment manager at Kane Island Alternative Advisors. He's also the author of When to Own Stocks and When to Own Gold. And I also, Tim, really love your uh, article called Bitcoin Spreads Like a Virus. Live from Western Australia, Mr. Timothy Peterson. Thank you so much, Scott. It was uh, very kind of you to have me on the show. I'm very excited to talk to you. So my understanding is you're based out of Texas originally, but you're in Australia at the moment. Is that correct? That's correct. So what's it like trying to follow the North American market when you're on the other side of the world? You know, uh, interestingly, I don't trade every day. Um, I do tend to look at the markets every day. And, you know, those overnight futures are a wonderful thing. News is 24-7. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, with modern technology, it's really easy to keep track of. So I've had no problem uh, managing client and assets and taking care of business overseas. In fact, you know, in my, in my past jobs, I've had um, global travel in, in two different jobs. And so I'm accustomed to working from different time zones in different places and, and meeting with people around the world at strange times. So it's not a problem. Very cool. Also, does the toilet water really flush the other way in Australia? Is that a thing? <laughs> you know, now that you say that, I've never even really looked. I couldn't even tell you which way it flushes in North America. So I wouldn't know if it was going one way or the other. I tend to not look. Uh, I just remember that from like a Simpsons episode, I think. And, and that's I remember that Simpsons. You know what? When I'm in Australia, I think of that Simpsons episode every time with the, with Homer <laughs> like doing, I think it was Amer singing America the Beautiful as the toilet flushes. <laughs> I do think about that. Yeah, that's, that's funny. That's so funny, man. So, Tim, tell me a, a bit about your background and how you got started in the market. Well, uh, you know, I graduated college with an economics degree uh, because I didn't do so hot at aerospace engineering. And I know there's a lot of failed engineers that wind up in business, but it, the math skills helped. Um, I, I had a career that, that sort of bounced around um, several different areas of investment management. It's always been institutional, but it's it's ranged from um, accounting to software design to um, international money management and advising. Uh, and after I had accomplished most of what I wanted to do in my career, I said, you know, I think I'm going to start working for myself. I had seen every facet of the investment management business. And so I'm in a good place to be able to, to run the show from, from my position. And uh, it's really been enjoyable. I don't regret it. As you get older in life, you don't want to have any regrets. And so I'm very happy doing what I'm doing, which is right now uh, running client portfolios uh, using a global macro strategy, which is the most flexible strategy. So it's a constant learning experience. I have to, uh, for example, uh, when lithium got hot, I had to learn about the mining industry. So you'll spend days reading about mining and uh, hard rock mining versus uh, brine and, and boring things like that. But it translates into into dollars and cents at the end of the day. So it's kind of fun for me. That's how I started in in trading. Actually, I started doing mining stocks, and uh, and you know learning about drill hole results and stuff like that. And then it honestly got too technical for me, and I just said, you know what? I'm not a geologist. Maybe I'll try and read charts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, tell me about your your current macro framework for the market that we're in. It's been a ride. Uh, you know, uh, we're seeing uh, the S&P uh, come down and some stocks come down to like some pretty uh, deep levels and uh, everyone is scared. We saw, you know, consumer confidence levels at some all-time lows, you know, uh, at least lows that we haven't seen for a long, long time. 
So um, what's your outlook for our, our current market now and then going forward, maybe the rest of the year? Yeah, I, I, I this is a great topic, and we could probably spend an hour just on this. We could actually probably spend two hours just on this. <laughs> but the the world is dramatically changing, and I, I know that sounds like drama. This is this is for real. We're going back to Cold War, right? 2.0, bipolar world, Russia, China versus the West. Uh, Saudi Arabia is in that mix. Uh, uh, India is in that mix, and so is uh, Brazil to some extent. Uh, and this is a fundamental rewrite of how the global economy is going to work. So this is not just, the, it's, and, it, and it really is all about Ukraine. Um, it's not just another war. Um, the recession is not just another recession. It's not a cyclical re recession. The market um, decline is not just another market decline. Uh, there are going to be permanent changes, permanent in the sense that this condition will last 50 to 100 years. Right? The last Cold War lasted, um, what was it, about 40, 50 years. And so there's no reason to think this Cold War won't last another 40 or 50 years. And that has serious implications for economies and markets. Um, food is going, going to be rationed. Uh, you know, here in Australia, there's been a shortage every week I've been here. First week, it was energy. Um, then it was lettuce. And this week, the, uh, just on the news, this, there's an egg shortage. That's going wow. to be normal now. That's, that's the new normal. And that's going to happen. This is a developed economy, right? Imagine that... Um, you know, developing and emerging markets, what they're going to have to go through. It's, it's, it's going to be kind of brutal. So, you know, this is, in my opinion, not the time to make, to, to take risks. It really isn't. Uh, you should be focused on um, doing some very basic things like uh, income and savings and job security and, and uh, budgeting. So what do you think can get us out of this situation? Is it just time? So fundamentally, there's there's two types of, of recessions, okay? And if you look back in history, you can even see it on a log S&P chart where it goes up and it has this flat area and it goes up and it has this flat area. And then in between those, there's these ups and downs. But this is sort of like the, what we're in, entering into now is like the 70s or from 2000 to 2008. There's going to be market ups and downs, but 10 years from now, you're going to look back and go, gee, the market didn't make any money. The problem is because it's what I call structural. This is not a cyclical recession where you have too much spending, you raise interest rates, spending comes back down and things go back to normal. This is supply driven. It's driven by the fact that Russia is withholding fertilizer from the world. And so that affects crop production. So that's food supply, very critical. Uh, Russia is rewriting the energy book they're disconnecting literally disconnecting entire countries from the energy grid that problem takes a long time to solve um, and then you have a concerted effort on the part of russia china and a few others to disconnect from the dollar completely and start their own global reserve alternative currency those are major changes that the Federal Reserve has absolutely zero control over. There is nothing the Federal Reserve can do with monetary policy or interest rate changes that is going to produce more oil, more energy, more food, or change this, the status of the world's reserve currency in light of what Russia and China could possibly do. And we keep hearing uh, Chair Powell come out and say a lot of the inflation has to do with supply it isn't a demand issue it's a supply issue you know to your point and so how do you think i guess how would you grade central banks for trying to manage this when they don't really have the tools to do so you know i've had the um the privilege of listening to the, the dallas fed president on two occasions and he's very astute uh, as much as bitcoiners and other people like to bang you know bash the fed that these guys do kind of know what they're doing. They have a job to do, but they're constrained in what they can do. The Fed will tell you that they're, one of their jobs is to get um, uh, consistent inflation or, or consistent pricing and full, full employment. And, and then they'll tell you, but there's only so much we can do because some of that is the responsibility of government. For example, to get full employment, you need healthy workers, you need educated workers. That's not something the Fed can do. That's government, right? That's, that's education funding. That's healthcare funding. Um, you need a supply of workers. That's immigration, for example, and birth rates. So there's a lot of things the Fed can't do. So with, within the, the cards we've been dealt, the Fed will say, hey, given what circumstances are, our goal is to 
change monetary policy to get to full employment or to keep prices stable. But right now, look at what California is doing, for example. And here in Australia, they're doing the same thing. They're dishing out money to help people pay for higher food and higher gasoline prices. Right? So they're cutting checks. <clears throat> That's money supply increase. That works directly in opposition to what the Federal Reserve wants to do. And so what government wants to do is keep people happy. But what the Fed want, needs to do is bring down inflation. And those two policies that are being enacted right now are directly in conflict with each other, which is why you get these long-term 10-year structural recessions, the, these secular bear markets that go sideways because the policies aren't aligned. And that's what's going to happen, and it is happening right now. You know, the energy policy in the United States, you, you, it's, it's ridiculous. The U.S. has enough energy to last 150 years for just itself. Uh, and and fix this entire crisis. All they got to do is pump out more energy, right? But the Biden administration is opposed to fossil fuel energy. And so they will go to the wall and limit that to whatever extent they possibly can, right? For, for their, it's, it's counter to their climate objectives. So they will not solve the energy crisis with the resources that the U.S. has. To replace the energy that uh, fossil fuels provides, it's probably a 50 year project, right? You just can't go willy nilly um, re change the power system. I mean, think about all the vehicles, all the heavy lift vehicles, all the, the, um, the freighters that go around the world, air transport, um, trains, converting all of that, let alone the, the basic power grid to an alternative non-fossil fuel system is, is a major multi-decade project. So we're, we're going to have to live with this for a while. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly is uh, kind of a scary situation. And it feels like at no, you know, very similar to the pandemic, where at no level of government, anyone really knows how to handle it. They only have a certain amount of tools. No one really talks to each other. And everyone is just trying to keep everyone happy for the short term. Yeah, well, that's that's what democracy is, right? Governments are slow. Democracy is messy. You go back, look at the Great Depression, right? For for them to pass the appropriate legislation to address the Great Depression causes took five to 10 years to get all of those laws enacted. We didn't get the Securities Act until uh, 33 and the Exchange Act in 34. And the Investment Advisors and Investment Company Act came along in, in the 40s. So... Um, I, this probably isn't going to be any different. You know, governments are just slow to to get through that learning curve and realize, like Winston Churchill said, America will eventually do the right thing after they've exhausted all the other opportunities. So is that what you think will eventually happen? They will just keep trying different things. They won't work. And then eventually they'll say, OK, well, let's just drill for more oil. Yeah, probably something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just don't see how it's going to work any other way. There are no quick fixes. There are no easy solutions. Some things take time and this will take time. Part of your uh, process at Cane Island has to do with gold. Uh, maybe tell me about your thoughts on gold. We did see it kind of pop a little bit after uh, Russia invaded the Ukraine. But if you look here today, you know, it is pretty flat. So it hasn't really worked as a traditional hedge in fact nothing has worked in this market in terms of a safe place to put your money other than really just kind of wait in cash but then to your other point about california they're, they're still printing money and so even that's kind of you know being inflated so what are your thoughts on uh, gold silver and other traditional inflation hedges right well scott you're right that the dollar is the cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry um <laughs> <laughs> it's it's what there is even though it's not great so gold, the gold has this reputation of being an inflation hedge, and it's not really an inflation hedge, and neither is Bitcoin. And what it is is a, it's a, um, it protects against loss of purchasing power in the long term. But so do lots of things. If you look at what gold um, does, gold's tied very closely to the debt level, in, in particular the U.S. debt level. And I've got some charts that one is the government debt versus gold price. It tracks very closely to the level of debt, there, with some exceptions. When you get into economic crises like in the 80s or in 2008, you'll see a spike in gold. There was a spike in COVID. Um, the other interesting thing I found out is if you look at the gold to silver ratio, which is a very popular ratio people like to look at, gold 
gold to silver tracks um, debt to GDP very closely, incredibly close. Now, it doesn't work for the period of 2011 because J.P. Morgan manipulated the price of silver during that time. And in fact, I think the, the guy was just sentenced only recently. But the, the, the gold to silver ratio in 2011 breaks down. So you can't use it during that period. You have to just use gold. But other than that, if you want to know where gold is headed, all you have to do is look at the, um, the debt level and debt to GDP in the United States. And it, it tracks very closely. The um, Congressional Budget Office puts out forecasts of the debt level of the U.S. And that's where gold's going to go. And it'll probably go a little bit higher than that every time we have a, a crisis. But yeah, inflation, not so much, but debt, yes, definitely. Yeah, so debt to the GDP tells the story. Uh, and, and debt, if you think debt is going to go up and GDP is going to go down, and here's a hint, yes, it probably is then gold's going to do well. In fact, so one of the papers I wrote that you alluded to at the beginning was um, when to own stocks and when to own gold. And and that runs in 10-year cycles, roughly. Okay, so we've just gotten through 10 years of equities being great. Uh, we're in for gold for the next 10 years, probably outperforming ex- equities, almost certainly, I would say. It's, it's a 100-year a track record that proves out. So I, I would overweight gold rather than overweight equities for the next 10 years, unless you're a really good stock picker, right? There's always some good buys out there, but in general, if you're a more passive uh, investor, I would stick with gold for uh, over the long term and not uh, stocks. And how do you like to do that? Do you like to use something like GLD or do you physically buy gold and keep it in a safe? What do you think Um, the best way is for most investors? That's a great question. So I, um, uh, you know, for my client portfolios, because a lot of them are retirement accounts, you know, I'm not out buying physical gold, right? I'll, I'll, most of my investment management exposure is is ETFs. But however, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm thinking really hard about getting some some physical gold. Uh, I think that uh, the the prospects for an escalation in Ukraine are underweighted uh, and underappreciated by the market. I used to be a poli sci major, and one of my um, focus areas was Soviet foreign policy. I studied for Soviet foreign policy for four years before I got into economics. Um, it's almost as a side side gig. And uh, there's a great deal of underappreciation for the, the risks involved with the current situation and the current realignment. So I am thinking about getting gold coins, um, you know, as a doomsday um, thing. I know people like to joke at that, I I went full prepper this past quarter. I mean, I went full prepper. I don't have a bunker, but I've got everything else because um, I've studied history. And man, there's been some narrow escapes out of nuclear war in this country. I don't think people today appreciate how close this country has come to being on the receiving end of some nuclear weapons. I would definitely consider some physical gold you know, this collectible coins, I don't think are really, I think those are kind of scammy, to be honest. But I'm headed to the Perth Mint today, by the way, right after this interview, going to the Perth Mint, going to go check out the gold, take a look and see what there is, and uh, maybe do a little shopping. Wow. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, you have to let me know how that goes. <laughs> I'll take photos. So, so when you <laughs> uh, are looking at precious metals, do you sp- uh, specifically stick to gold or do you look at other things like silver? You know, I, I've looked at silver for almost 30 years. And, and I say, look, because all I've done is look. I, I've never seen it do this great breakout that people always seem to say is coming. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And, and the reason gold has been a superior metal is because it's a superior metal, you know, in terms of its um, its chemistry. It's just a, a better suited metal for coinage and exchange. And uh, it's slightly more rare than silver and it's more malleable. It's got a lower melting point. And, and that's why gold has always been more valuable than silver. So I, I, maybe silver is a diversification benefit. I think if I was gonna look at other metals, I might look at some other rare earths or other precious metals. I've dabbled in palladium and, and platinum in part because those have industrial uses as well. And they're, they're used, for example, um, cleaning out the muck out of uh, fossil fuel production sites. So in fact, one of my friends runs a business where he has to get 
platinum and palladium. And they, they are used in the filters for, um, for energy production uh, with uh, oil and gas. Hmm. And so, I mean, if you, if you want to say, hey, we're still going to be using oil and gas in the next 20 years, but you want to meet climate change goals, well, platinum and palladium are a critical part of that. And by the way, a bunch of that stuff is in Russia. <laughs> so I think there's going to be some scarcity there that, that rears its head. There was a news story that came out that they found a bunch of gold, I think it was in Africa somewhere. Um, what do you think when they <coughs> when they find these deposits, um, you know, as someone who likes the scarcity aspect of gold, what goes through your mind and how do you approach that or does it even matter? So my idea of scarcity is not what most people think. And I, I, I think the scare, we can talk about this with Bitcoin as well, but scarcity doesn't really mean limited supply. And, and somebody will point out to an article and say, hey, there's a big meteor out there and it's full of gold. And then they're like, aha, see, gold's worthless. Um, <laughs> sc- scarcity means that you have to, it's hard to get, right? Something that is scarce is hard to get. Air isn't scarce because I don't have to make a choice um, to give up something to get air or water, right? I just, they're, they're abundant enough and neither is sunlight and you need those things to live, right? But I don't have to make an economic choice. The food, I've got to make an economic choice. Do I want to buy food or do I want to buy medicine? Uh, if you have to give up something of value, then, then that identifies something that's scarce. So my, my signature, I can write my signature on 10 pieces of paper and say, Hey, it's scarce, but uh, who wants it, right? There's only 10 of them and it's hard to, hard to get, but you don't really have to make an economic choice there because um, if some people say it doesn't have utility. Well, sure it does. You can steal my identity with it. New, new discoveries of resources, they do affect the supply and demand. I'm not too concerned with it. I think there's decent technology out there that we, we have a, a, a picture of what could be available, but if it's in the ground, it's really not part of the supply yet. Uh-huh. No, that's a good point. It, it takes work to get it out. So there's an economic choice to be made. Tim, one of the things that uh, you said that caught my ear was that you started preparing for kind of the cycle we're in now, like late last year. And so I'm wondering, what was your signal to kind of get ready? Because there was a little chatter about inflation, hyperinflation. You know, the Fed has gone too far. The Fed isn't acting fast enough. Is that what you believed? And if so, what, what led you to that conclusion? Oh, so I wrote this paper called When to Own Stocks and When to Own Gold. And, it, and it's a metric that basically, if you know what the Schiller PE ratio is or the CAPE ratio, which is a, a price to earnings multiple that's basically a 10-year average. And Bob Schiller at Yale showed that it was predictive of stock returns over 10 years. But then after that, well, he wrote a book and he won the Nobel Prize and then the metric stopped working, right? It, it wasn't predictive anymore. Um, it turns out if you compare that metric against something like gold, uh, it works really well. And so I wrote that paper. It got published in the Journal of Wealth Management. And that signal just triggered in December of 2021. And it said, the the bull market's over. It's time to go defensive and get in the gold. And so that's what I started doing is, is to brace for a 70s style decade or a 2000s style decade or a 30s style decade, because I think that's I think that's what we're in for. I think that that's really what kind of attracted uh, me to you and your style, Tim, was that it's it's based on data driven analysis. And I feel like, especially on Twitter, there's so many opinions out there, uh, but you actually build models and look at uh, different types of adoption, different types of signals. I'd like to flip over to Bitcoin a little and, and tell me about your paper called Bitcoin Spreads Like a Virus. Uh, could you share your current thesis for BTC? both long-term and in this current environment and why you think it is important enough for you to care about? Bitcoin is like every other technology and we know what technologies do. They follow this S-curve of, of adoption. And you can see it in telephone networks. You can see it in, in automobile networks. You can see it in um, radio and TV networks. You can see it in the internet. This pattern repeats over and over again. Now the S-curve might be shaped slightly differently, but there's software out there that can measure that, that S-curve, and you can actually predict where it's going to be. Um, I came across Metcalf's Law in 2016, 
And it was the first uh, thesis about network value that made sense to me. And, and so I use Metcalfe's law as do most institutions. They, uh, the, the Metcalfe's law statement is very simple. It just says, hey, bigger networks have more value. Uh, but what Metcalf really does is it tells you what that quantity is. What's the relationship between users and value and price? And uh, so I've put probably seven years, a, a good 10,000 hours into understanding how Metcalf's law works, what the nuances are, and came to the conclusion that, that without a doubt, Bitcoin is a Metcalf asset, as is Twitter, as is the internet, as is um, the U.S. highway system, as is the telephone system, as is the satellite system that we have for communications. It's just everywhere. I've, I've tracked it down to the Roman road system uh, back in antiquity, the British Empire and its network of, of ships. I, I, I've mashed all this data up and it's just over and over and over again. It's there. It's, it's a real thing. It's like E equals MC squared. It really does exist. And it's in a lot more things than people can appreciate. So I've learned that users drive price, right? So the more users Bitcoin gets, it's just like Facebook. It's just like Twitter. It's just like a mobile phone system. You need people on the system and it needs to continue to grow for that value to go up. If it gets de-adopted, right? Or, or I don't know, unadopted, whatever the word would be. You know, if it starts to lose users, it's going to start to lose value. And, uh, and, I don't think I don't see it losing users. Actually, the truth is, Bitcoin, just despite what happens with the price, Bitcoin is still growing in terms of its user activity even today. That's interesting. I'd love to uh, share your Bitcoin adoption uh, page from uh, the report you sent me, and maybe you could walk us through uh, how this works and and where you see price ultimately going. Yeah, so if you take an S curve and you put it on a log scale, you get this, um, I don't know what you would call it, this parabolic um, looking shape. And Bitcoins followed that shape pretty closely, except in periods where the price was manipulated. That's a separate paper that other people have written, and I, I've written on that as well. But that trend line represents exponential growth in users applied to Metcalfe's law. Invariably, it comes back down to that uh, trend line. So these estimates here, now they, these estimates might, I might reduce these a little bit because um, there are people that don't understand this and therefore just value Bitcoin like a tech stock. And I think that's, that's wrong, <laughs> you know, I think, it, but it could take years to play out for people to realize that that approach is wrong. So the behavior of Bitcoin's price isn't always indicative of the value that's underneath it. But yeah, as long as Bitcoin continues on its trend, so the most recent um, data that I have, and it's not on here, is that user growth is increasing at 15% a year, which means roughly that Bitcoin's value would increase at 30% per year. 30% per year from $30,000 as of June. So just do 30% a year from June, and you know that's probably Bitcoin's floor value. Now, we're well below that now because... Times are tough, right? We're, go we're going through this huge period of uncertainty and every asset value suffers during times like that. Eventually it will correct. Now, I don't know if it corrects in six months or if it corrects in six years, but eventually it will correct. And so as someone who is invested in or trading around a position in Bitcoin, how do you use this to, to do that? Do you trade the ebbs and flows or do you just sit back and say, OK, I know when the market is undervalued and that's when we should be buying more. I know when the market is overvalued and that's when we should be lightening a position. Yeah, I don't. So first of all, my personal strategy is I don't trade or day trade the way most people think of buying low and selling high. I use a, a formula called Kelly um, Criterion. Uh, Kelly Criterion is famous for being the method used to beat blackjack. Um, early on when card counting was developed. These are the guys that actually developed card counting. Um, they were not professional gamblers. They were scientists at Bell Labs uh, and very, very bright people. These are the same group that came up with um, Shannon's information theory. So John Kelly uh, came up with this uh, formula, which says, how much do you bet, if you will, based on what the odds and the outcomes are? 
in a way that will maximize your long-term total value. And, and there's a, you know, a Wikipedia page on what Kelly Criterion is. Uh, once you know what the outputs are going to be in terms of uh, probabilities and where the price is going to be, the formula works itself. And so I follow that Kelly Criterion formula. Uh, in fact, the, the methodology I use is um, published in another paper on my website called um, Using Metcalf's Value to Forecast Bitcoin Returns or something to that effect. And you can tell when it's too high. It, you know, there's you can look at price to addresses, price to transactions, um, price to user growth. When those metrics go sky high, it's you you probably shouldn't be holding so much of it. And when it's low like it is now, um, you might want to think about overrate overweighting your position. However, we're in a we're in a bear market now. So w- when you get into genuine bear markets and recessions, most assets all correlate and they all go down together. So I'm very skeptical that over the next six months, right, this is not necessarily a buy the dip moment. Bitcoin could go very low and, and you know, it could go to 10,000. I saw in some numbers. In fact, one I came up with said Bitcoin could go to 3,000. If it was easy to do, you know what? We'd all be on yachts, right? I mean, it would all be easy and, and we'd have it all figured out. Every new cycle comes with its own quirks, and this one is that we're entering, you know, a global recession. There's not a lot of good choices out there, and Bitcoin's getting drugged down with the rest of them. I think wrongly so, but it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the asset does, and it's performing poorly, and I don't like catching falling knives. Definitely, and I will say you're very generous with your research, and I'll be sure and include links so people can see these articles from your Kane Island Digital uh, website uh, in the show notes. So thank you very much for being so open with kind of your uh, view on on digital assets and and uh, and stuff like that. I, I think that's so cool, and just you know really kind of brings that collaborative nature of the market together. You know, the more people that understand Bitcoin the way it works the better off everyone will be in the long term. My role in that is to educate mostly institutions, but other high net worth and professional investors as to the mechanics of, of that. And I think that that education gets rid of a, a lot of the ignorance and fear. Uh, it makes Bitcoin a safer asset. And so that's my contribution to the community. Do you believe that Bitcoin is digital gold? Um, yes and no. Uh, it, it ticks all the boxes. Uh, if you look at what gold is and why gold has value, it meets all those requirements. Those requirements, uh, the first four, portable, divisible, durable, and scarce, those were all uh, part of uh, Aristotle's thesis. Aristotle put a lot of work in this. So way back in antiquity, he said, here's what makes good money. Accepted is a new one that's come out in the 20, 20th century. Uh, Because if nobody uses your money, then it's not worth a lot. And Bitcoin ticks all those boxes. Uh, It it really does. And I think it really is money. And I'd say it's like a digital gold coin because it's spendable. It's not a lot like, uh, you know, gold in a vault and and bricks, but it is a lot more like a gold coin. Now, unfortunately, (laughs) it doesn't behave like a gold coin. Right? It, it's not being viewed as a safety asset. It's being viewed as a speculative asset. One of the things I learned early in my career is it really doesn't matter what you call the investment or what the characteristics are in, of the investment are, how it behaves is the most important thing. And unfortunately, gold behave, or Bitcoin behaves like a leveraged tech stock. So as long as people treat it like a leveraged tech stock, it's going to behave like a leveraged tech stock. And its true potential won't be realized until more people get educated as to what makes good money and why Bitcoin can be good money. Yeah, I was going to ask, why do you think we have that uh, kind of correlation with tech generally? Uh, Because, I mean, it does take work, I guess, to uh, learn about Bitcoin. and, And it took me a year or two to kind of figure it out. And I'm still going, right? And so why do you think we have that correlation? Why do you think there is such a lack of education? Uh, because people are people and they don't want to spend their time with a bunch of, you know, their nose in a book for, for a year learning about gold and Bitcoin and economics, right? They they want to live their lives and they want to improve their, their bottom line. And so people are, you know, apt to take shortcuts on that journey, which is where you get 
you know, technical analysis and charting. You know, I went to school for 14 years, 14 years of hardcore economics and finance study for me to get to where I'm at. You, you don't need to do that. You can learn about charting in 15 minutes. So a lot of people will go that route. Um, uh, and I'm not really being facetious here. I mean, there's a lot of people that just want to, you know, the cliff notes version of, of how things work. And it's, it's typically not adequate. So when you talk about Bitcoin, eh, it's, it's electronic money. Okay. It's on a computer. It's got cryptography. It's got computer code. It's tech, right? It's tech. And therefore portfolio managers will sort of treat it like tech. When they allocate their portfolio positions, they have a position allocated to technology stocks and Bitcoin gets lumped in with that. They don't lump it in with commodities. If they lumped it in with commodities, it would behave differently. But because institutional portfolio managers throw it in the tech bucket, it behaves like tech. Where do you think we are in terms of, I guess, the internet? You know, I've seen uh, the charts of uh, Bitcoin versus the internet and how uh, crypto in general and digital property is uh, growing faster than the internet. So in terms of Comparing it to the internet, maybe comparing it to the 90s and early 2000s, where do you think we are in that, uh, in that cycle? Um, we are, what is it, 10 or I guess 12 years uh, into Bitcoin. And I think we're roughly 12 years into where the internet would be starting from, I want to say about 1991. So what would that be, about 2000? Two, right? The dot com bust. Hey, it, it even matches up in terms of the performance. Um, I think that's a coincidence, but I, I think we're we're where the internet was in about two thousand one, two thousand two. Now that's still pretty early, right? If you think about what was going on with the internet, it was about retail sales, right? Mostly, you know, there were a lot of, of client facing or customer facing websites being built. And it was just a, another way of advertising. And that's that's really not the power of the internet. We didn't get peer-to-peer uh, -peer and, and mobile phone and personalization until 2008. So I, look, I've, I've sort of come to the conclusion that new technologies that are successful, they have to die a horrible death and then be reborn before they come around. This happened with the telephone, by the way. The telephone really took off. It's obvious what the benefits were. The Great Depression hit telephone sales and use dropped dramatically right and and then after that after world war ii the telephone was in every home uh you had similar things happen with the automobile around that time the internet had its death right in 2001 2002 it died it was you know written off and then it just gets reborn into this you know blossoming huge thing i think bitcoin's going through this it's death Right. And this is going to be the, the first death of Bitcoin. And from that will rise something that is much more powerful, like a Jedi Knight, so to speak, uh, that, that'll um, be a lasting incarnation of what Bitcoin is. Yeah, that kind of leads me to our uh, my next question uh, just on Bitcoin is how do you see it? Uh, you know, maybe not from a technical standpoint, but just like generally, how do you see Bitcoin interacting in our lives down the road? Is it on layer two, layer three applications? Is it on the base layer? Is it, uh, is it digital property? You know, Michael Saylor will say, you're buying a piece of digital Manhattan. How do you see it interacting in our lives down the road, Tim? I, I think that's a good analogy. I think it's a digital, um, you know, safe deposit box. Uh, it's scalable to whatever size you want to uh, value what you want to put in it. It's exchangeable, which lockboxes aren't exchangeable. So I, I think it's 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 really a new thing. When Satoshi wrote his white paper and he was blogging about what it was, he says it, he he lamented how hard it was to do the education for it. He goes, "There's nothing to compare it to. We're still struggling with that. What is it like? It's not like anything we've had before." And that's why a lot of people can't buy into the value proposition because they don't have a basis of comparison. To me, it's, it's, a, it's a savings vehicle. It's a truly digital savings vehicle, one where I control. So I tell people, how is it different from you know, me putting money in, um, in the bank? Because that's electronic money. And I say, well, because I want my money 
on my computer. I don't want somebody else's money on somebody else's computer. Uh, and that's the fiat system is somebody else's money on somebody else's computer. But if I want my money on my computer and I want to be exchanged it with you, Scott, the same way I exchange cash, which is nobody in between, just me send it to you electronically from my computer to your computer. Why can't I do that? Now, that may not have like broad application, but it's useful for some people. And all it needs to be is useful for some people. It doesn't need to, to go through the entire world and everybody use it. Not everybody goes to McDonald's either, but it does all right. So, uh, you know, I think there's lots of applications for it that probably haven't even been discovered yet. But the most basic one is, um, you know, not necessarily the libertarian aspects of it, but just the very simple idea that I want to be able to, to send money back and forth directly between participants electronically and not have to worry about that getting censored or cut off or devalued or anything like that. Do you think Bitcoin will eventually, in terms of its price, stabilize to a level where other institutions or people will stop saying or joking, hey, look, I told you it's worthless because you know it lost 60% of its value. I told you so, because I feel like that's what a lot of Twitter is anytime there's any sort of price fluctuation. You know, like two weeks ago, it felt like uh, when Bitcoin dipped down to like 17,000 for a bit, it felt like it, Twitter was like uh, doing like a happy dance. All the bears were like, I told you so, um, you know, and, and you could definitely see who missed that trade uh, <laughs> because everyone who missed that 600 percent ride up was uh, sure as hell happy to see it uh, drop down. I don't think that volatility is going to go away. It's mitigating, but there's there's things about the architecture of Bitcoin that create volatility. And then there's things about the market that create that volatility. In the market, we have lots of leverage and lots of manipulation. Okay, so that's where most of the volatility comes from. But also the way that Bitcoin limits transactions, it throttles those transactions into seven per second or whatever it is. And uh, that also adds to volatility because it creates problems with liquidity. And you know, until we get to a point where uh, probably decades away where the halvings are, are not really relevant and, and the new coin issuance isn't, uh, you know, so, such a factor. And we have uh, faster um, transaction mechanisms that that volatility is going to stick around. And so I still see volatility for the next 10 or 15 years at least. And, and that's going to scare a lot of people away. I mean, People, people in Twitter can get excited about the price dropping, but you have to understand every time Bitcoin's price drops, um, you know, by more than 30, 40, 50 percent, there is a whole class of people in the world that look at that and go, I'm never buying that. Right. So that and that hurts. OK, that hurts. Remember, adoption drives price. So you scare away people every one of these cycles. Your pool of what Bitcoin's price could be in the future gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so this volatility actually harms price. I know people think it helps. It does not help. Um, it's not true in equities. It's not true in gold. It's not true in anything. Volatility reduces the future value and the present value of an asset. And you think that uh, adding a layer two applications down the road, when they become a little more mainstream, that that should calm some of it. You know, and it's not just the transaction speed, right? The user interfaces that exist for Bitcoin transactions are terrible, terrible, right? This needs to work for your mom and dad, okay? You're, if your mom and dad can't easily go on and move money the way they can in a bank account and do it with Bitcoin and have it done reliably, then it's not going to go anywhere. I know younger generations are catching on to it, but there's no need for it to be simple. There's no need for people to accidentally send money to a wrong address and go, oops, all my money was gone. Uh, that, that, that problem should have been solved years ago, and it hasn't been solved. And I don't know why it's not being solved. It seems like there's money in it, right, if you just charge a few sats for um, a good interface. But there aren't any good interfaces. There's nothing out there that, in my opinion, satisfies that requirement of having ease of use as well as speed of transaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tweeted out something, uh, a clip from a Mark Cuban interview that I watched uh, a few days ago, I think. And and he was really talking about the application layer and how he believes that that's the next level to get the next billion people in on crypto is to have 
applications that make sense. You know, I was yeah. I was actually buying an NFT today uh, that my friend sent me, and it, you know, it was only a hundred bucks or whatever. And I'm like, okay, sure, I'll buy one. And the gas fee on Ethereum kept fluctuating to the point where it just became frustrating. And I just said, who else is going to do this? You know, is is it going to cost me fifty dollars or twenty dollars or forty seven cents? Which one is it, man? <laughs> and and, uh, and you know, because it kept messing around, and then the transaction. I uh, kept getting stalled. Oh, yeah. Sorry, you don't have enough money. Okay, well, I'll buy some more. Oh, no, it changed again. And and to your point, that application layer, I think is going to be so important, uh, but also the consistency when it comes to how these protocols work. Yeah, well, let's hope. Let's hope one comes <laughs> along. So speaking about Ethereum, in February, uh, Kane Island put out a three-factor model for valuing Ethereum. I got a Ethereum... Uh, uh, chart here from the slide that you or the deck that you uh, sent me can you walk us through uh how you value ethereum versus bitcoin how do you view it generally yeah one of the things you have to look at with alts is that first of all you have to start from the premise this that most people don't know about metcalf's law or or they don't care and uh, so they take their cues on what the price should be from other assets. And that's common even in the traditional world, right? We want to look at a, a stock. We look at a comparable stock and see how the performance goes. So absent some other information, when people buy and sell alts and Ethereum in particular, they will take their cues from Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the dominant asset out there. And even, even if it's not rational, people will still do it. So most uh, of of Ethereum's performance is intrinsic. It comes from things like user growth and transaction volume. And that's about what I got there. 70% of Ethereum's price is from Metcalf effects, network effects, the growth in users, the um, use of the, the token. But some of it isn't. Um, some of it comes from just Bitcoin moving up and down. Now, those two things shouldn't have an impact on each other. I'm not a believer that Ethereum competes with, with Bitcoin in any way. I look at Ethereum completely differently. It's a database. It's a programmable database where you can store data on it and transact and monetize that data. That's that's a completely different use case from, from Bitcoin. It's not going to overtake Bitcoin in terms of its use case. Uh, maybe it would in terms of its cap, but I think that's also um, doubtful. So, you know, uh, Ethereum really does look a lot more like a tech stock, to be honest, but it it gets its uh, value from from Bitcoin in part, and then there's some other factors out there as well that are you know, random noise and, and who knows what. But most of it comes from its internal um, uses uh, in terms of user growth and transactions. Does seasonality play a part uh, in terms of digital assets? I mean, we only have that 13 year window with Bitcoin, but in your analysis have you noticed you know some people say oh it's alt season or oh it's bitcoin season you know you can kind of measure bitcoin's dominance do you look at that at all i i did i and i wrote a paper called um proof of alt season i was surprised i i hadn't learned much about seasonality uh until uh a guy named uh barry banister at stiffel nicholas came and gave a presentation in houston that i attended and he explained seasonality very well and I did a lot more research into it. So let's forget about altcoins, but just in the equity markets and real estate and every other market, to be honest, um, seasonality is a real thing. You do get these end of year from about December, or I guess it could go from October to April or December to May, depending on how you want to look at it. These boosts in, um, in asset returns that coincide with an annual calendar. And the interesting thing is it happens in all assets and everywhere around the world in all markets. It's a real thing. I was, I was really surprised to learn that. So when I started looking at altcoins, uh, it all made a lot more sense. And I did do some statistical analysis and find that seasonality does exist in altcoins. It runs from approximately December through April or May. Uh, however, there's a caveat to that. Uh, and people are finding out this year. In years with that feature a recession, seasonality doesn't come into play. Uh, and it and it has to do with uh, to explain why seasonality exists. Think about being an institutional portfolio manager in September or October, and the next year's estimates are starting to come in as to what performance of a, of a particular stock was going to be. And 
some of them you know, you might think are going to be bad um, or you're at least skeptical. And so you panic. And they're, they're, that's why we have so many crashes in October and September is because you're fearful about the coming year. It's too uncertain. So you get this sell-off in um, fourth quarter. And then the year rolls around, okay? And you start getting the, um, the estimates, uh, revised estimates in for earnings in January and in April. And they're, there's a surprise effect there. They're positive. And that boosts the, you get a relief rally. Except in recession years where the estimates come in and they're like, oh, things are going to be bad. And you don't get that relief rally. We didn't get that alt season this year because the estimates that were coming in January through April were all to the downside. You see, in, in fact, Nomura just revised the U.S. GDP down to negative for the first time uh, in, in a decade. So, uh, yeah, it's a real thing. It's a real thing as long as you're not in a, a bear market and recession. But in positive times, you can actually generate some alpha by trading the, uh, that December to May window. That's interesting. Yeah, that that actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, even you think of just 2018, you know, 2018, when did things start to roll over? It was October until, you know, I think, just, you know, the end of December. And then that's when the market kind of did its thing and bounced back. And then this year, again, kind of the same structure. We had Bitcoin uh, in crypto breakdown October, November, and then equities kind of follow. Yeah, there's also another theory that, it, you know, I don't know if you've heard about seasonal, what is it, seasonal something disorder, uh, where in the winter, um, you know, people get depressed. And, uh, you know, as winter rolls along and you get September, October, you, you get people that are less optimistic in their outlook on life. It's just a, a human thing. And it has, could possibly do with the amount of sunlight you're getting. Most markets are in the Northern Hemisphere. And, and so sunlight gets reduced. People start feeling so bad. The bad news starts to pile up and uh, you get, it shows up in the markets. And that's, there is a reason why most crashes in the, in the S and P 500 have occurred in September and October. There's a huge disproportion of down months in, um, in the year in September and October. And, it, you know, it doesn't happen uh, every year, but it certainly does happen. That's interesting. So when it comes to portfolio construction and digital assets, although right now I'm getting the sense you're saying, you know what, everyone, let's just wait and see how this plays out. How should people construct uh, a proper portfolio, uh, including digital assets in this current market environment? Well, I would say the first thing you need to look at is a, this sounds very basic, but it's true don't put all your eggs in one basket. Okay. There, there are only four ways to lose all your money. Okay. And, and putting all your eggs in one basket is one way to, to lose all your money. All right. Once you lose all your money, you're out of the game forever. So don't do that. Um, another way to lose all your money is to go short. And so as much as, you know, Bitcoin's going down and other assets are going down, I almost never go short with my portfolio assets. Uh, once in a while I will, if I'm really certain, I mean, there's like no guesswork involved or if I'm hedging something, but stay away from shorting, stay away from leverage. Leverage can turn an ordinary loss into a catastrophic loss. Uh, and, and so don't do that either. And then the fourth way to lose everything is just simply bad luck, right? Which isn't in your control. So, so the first thing you got to do is keep your money. So don't use leverage. Don't, <laughs> don't go short. Um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. That said, um, with respect to Bitcoin and what should my allocation be to Bitcoin or, or any other digital asset, look, if you're younger, you can put more into those volatile assets. Uh, if you're older, you should be putting less into those volatile assets. I would pay attention, especially right now, I would pay attention to the correlation with equities. You know, as long as this correlation is tight, don't try to market time. Don't try to do anything. I'm, I'm pretty conservative in terms of my outlook, right? Like I'm not trying to buy the bottom and sell the top. I don't have to do that. All I have to do is advance my portfolio down the field and, and grow it over time. Right? That's my goal. I want to end up with more than I, than I started with. I absolutely don't try to time anything because I, I find that it's really, really difficult and most people can't do it. I can ride the wave so I can, I can look at momentum. Right now, the momentum is not in my favor. So I'm not going to allocate to something that's going to go down. And uh, it's, it's probably better to just wait. This, this bear market will end. 
I've tweeted when it's going to end. We've probably got another um, 12 to 17 months of down market in equities. And at that point, I might start looking at going you know, long again in, in certain assets other than commodities. Right now, most of my portfolio is in commodities and, and, uh, and related assets like that. 12 to 17 months. Tim, the moon boys, their hearts I know are it. breaking hearing Look, that. I know it, but... <laughs> I, I I miss those good days when I could look at my portfolio and make thirty thousand dollars having a cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know I'm not I'm not expressing a you know a bearish sentiment. Like my opinion really doesn't matter. I just know the way markets work and how economies work. The best thing you can do is just be patient, and uh, and sometimes investing is boring. And this could be one of those ugly, boring times, but know that it does end and know that it there's a, a deadline to it, right? It's just not going to go down forever. It, it will recover. And look at whatever you feel you need to look at to get good advice. But I look at fundamentals and, uh, and when those fundamentals change around, the good times will happen again. Fantastic. Well, Tim, you have been very generous with your time. I appreciate uh, this conversation, you know, I, I've really gotten a lot out of uh, looking into your research and would love to uh, share how people can get in touch with you and follow the work that you're doing, because I think it's great. Yeah, I've got two Twitter um, accounts. One is at Kane Digital, C-A-N-E Digital. The other was N Squared Macro. Uh, and then my website that I have my educational material on is cane-island.digital and uh, most everything is free uh, i've got some paid research on there uh, which will be going on sale tomorrow by the way it'll be um, reduced price starting tomorrow for some of that paid research but a lot of stuff is out there for free and i do a lot of free tweets on twitter that are alpha generated well thank you very much for your time tim uh, it's been great to speak with you and uh, hopefully uh, you and i can catch up again in a few months i'd appreciate it Scott. thank you for having me from the bottom, make no half stepping. I'm the dog, I made it through so they don't ask questions. Long Beach, and it ain't no half repping. Once a dog, always a dog, so they don't ask questions.